It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm Austin Peterson. I'm joined by my co-host, as always, Landon Mance from Las Vegas. And if this is the first time you're tuning into our show, we'll just describe real quick what we do here at Tycoons of Small Biz. Our, our show is literally about propping up small businesses throughout the country who we know and believe are the true backbone of the American economy. Landon and I are also small business owners, and we both have parents that were small business owners. And we feel it's crucial that 99% of the businesses in our country get highlighted in some way, shape, or form. And we're trying to do our part through Tycoons of Small Biz. So with that said, we are excited to have on the program today, today's guest, Ilya Zagovich, founder and CEO of DBD Partners, LLC, coming to us live from Park City, Utah. Ilya, thank you. Hi, how are you guys? Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, we're excited to have you here. And uh, we, you know, we had our, our pre-show or our pre-call, I guess, where we discussed a little bit about your background and, and you being in Park City. And I told you that Landon and I both have ties to Utah itself. Um, I grew up in Utah. I'm a snowboarder. I know you're a skier and we'll get into that in a little bit. And, you know, we, we've already started butting heads about the mountains in Utah compared to uh, other places. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, we are excited to hear, uh, to hear your story. So let's, let's start there, actually. Tell us about Ilya, the person. How did you grow up? You know, where did you grow up? How did you get to where you are today? Family, kids, any of that kind of stuff that we would, uh, we'd love to hear. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so I was born in, in Mexico City uh, from a Yugoslavian dad and, and a Mexican Italian mother. And when I was around eight months old, we moved to Serbia. Well, Yugoslavia back then, you know, this was before the separation. I lived there the first few years of my life and then as things started to get shady and, and so forth, we moved back to Mexico. And, you know, I think when I was like five years old, we moved back to Mexico City. And, and that's where I grew up. I grew up in Mexico City, went to school there, uh, you know, high school through college, started working, my working career there, etc. And eventually, when I was 32, I moved to New York City and been in the U.S. ever since uh, and recently relocated to, to Park City. Yeah, that's great. So I have to ask, do you speak three different languages or maybe even more? I do. I speak, uh, I speak Spanish, of course. Uh, I, the first language I, I learned to speak is Serbian, which I still speak a little bit of it. I, I honestly don't practice it that much. I only speak with my sister and my mother sometimes when we don't want other people to know what we're saying. Uh, but it's, yeah, and then I speak English. Uh, that's, that's it. Uh, other people, like, like my mother speaks five languages my grandmother used to speak seven languages uh my sister i think speaks speaks four so i'm, I'm lagging behind I, I need to learn another one <laughs> you know i tell you it's it's kind of a lost art or at least uh, the understanding of the importance of something like that in our country here in the u.s you know it, it's rare to meet people who speak more than one language right if you didn't grow up speaking the other language now I lived in Europe for two years, and so I, I learned and, and speak French, um, and actually went on to get a bachelor's degree in French. And so I've I've done a pretty good job of keeping it up. And uh, same thing, my wife and I. So my wife speaks French as well. My wife and I, when the kids were younger, we would speak French to each other when we didn't want the kids to know what we were talking about. Uh, did they learn any French, the kids? So when my son was born, my son's now 21. When, when he was born, I spoke nothing but French to him for the first year and a half of his life. And then we, my wife's parents moved to Stockholm for a year and a half. And they asked us to come and house sit for them and live in their house. And we were still pretty young newlyweds. I was finishing up college. And so not having to pay rent was obviously an enticement. <laughs> um, we finished a, a rental contract about a month and a half before they left. 
And so we moved into their house for a month and a half and it just got to be too confusing with them and me speaking another language to our son. And so I stopped and I, I wish I hadn't because uh, that would have been beneficial for my son, but he did actually go. So he started taking French in high school and dropped it because it was too difficult and started taking Spanish because as you know, the grammar is a little bit easier in Spanish than it is in French. Yeah. Um, and then he actually just spent two years doing the same thing that I did when I was his age, just got back in December from Denmark. So now he speaks fluent Danish. Gotcha. No, I was asking that because I've read somewhere that if, if you speak to a, to a child that's, you know, in, in the first few years, in the forming years, anywhere between one to five years, and you speak in another language that their native tongue, it just activates something in their brain that will give them an easiness to learn languages further down the road. Mostly linguistically, maybe not that much the grammar and the writing and stuff like that, but they'll be able to pick up new languages. Uh, I don't know. I don't have kids, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've seen those same studies, and I, I would say that it's definitely true, and it doesn't even have to be that, that it's that language, right? It's just the fact that you know, Spanish rolls out, rolls out of the mouth differently than French does, than English yeah. does, than Italian does, than, you know, and Danish is way different. So it, it, but it's, you get used to using your mouth a little bit differently than just speaking English the way that you always do. Yeah. And I think it also, it, it, it makes some different brain connections. Uh, I was just speaking with my team the other day about like languages and stuff. And one of them asked me like, like in what language do you dream? And mm -hmm. if I'm in the U.S. and I'm dreaming about something going on in the U.S., I dream in English. But if I dream dream of my family, I I dream in Spanish. Uh, if I'm doing business, I, I'm always thinking in English. If I'm doing math for a business, like while we're in a call or something like that, I'll do the math in English. Uh, but if I'm probably my house just counting stuff by myself I'll do it in Spanish mm. uh, and I think that's when you're real like really like bilingual or multilingual when you start thinking in that uh, language not translating from another language to it uh, yeah no doubt about it that's that's when I knew that I was truly fluent in French is when I started dreaming in in French when I lived in Belgium and France yeah for sure well Ilya, let me jump in real quick. You know, don't don't sell yourself yourself short, my friend, because you are an investment banker and you speak MA, which is a very foreign language to 99.9% of the population. So you got to give yourself that. True, true. I, I, okay, so I speak four. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> m a or, or like New York City bullshitting, as I like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> we just make it sound way more complicated than it is. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, speaking of m a so, I mean, DVD Partners, that, you know, m a is part of what you guys do, but let's just start at the beginning. Tell us what DVD Partners is. You're a co-founder. So how yep. did you get started and, and what is it that you guys do day to day? For sure. So I started working in investment banking. In my career, I started, you know, back when I was in college in Mexico, I started working for a marketing company. Uh, eventually, I did a management buyout of that business. I didn't know that that was what I was doing, but I, I found a way of buying out the current uh, or the previous owners, bought them out, did a roll up of a bunch of companies, eventually exited that business. Uh, and I found it really, really interesting to do all of those transactions and how you can finance it and how you can integrate businesses and you can actually grow into different geographies, et cetera, without having to, like, you know, greenfield or the, the thing starting from scratch, you can just go and acquire and, and there's financial efficiencies and all of that. So that's how I started my career. I started mechanical engineering, nothing to do with finance or, or anything like that. But, you know, you get a job and, and you start working and you figure out what you like. Uh, Eventually, when I moved to the U.S., I was working on, on fine, like in the finance business uh, back in Mexico, but most of the funding came from the, from the U.S. We were doing uh, direct lending to consumer and small businesses in, in Mexico and Latin America. And I really, I really enjoy finance. I really enjoy, it makes sense to me. Uh, you know, there, there's people, there's artists that know how to paint and they see a canvas and, and they can just draw something, et cetera. For me, business and finance just makes sense in, in, my, in my brain. And in 2015, I was in between 
different projects and, and like exiting, uh, we had exited the marketing business where we're exiting the finance business, the lending business. And I met the, the chairman and, and CEO of one to one, which is one of the largest uh, lower middle market investment banks in Europe uh, through YPO and, and HBS. And he offered me to come work with, for him and, and start the US division of, of one to one. Uh, they had no footprint in the United States. And at first I said no, uh, to be honest, I, I thought investment bankers were a bunch of assholes. That was my, and I still think we are. <laughs> that, that was my, my insight, but he, he was pretty persistent and, and you know, eventually invited me to spend two weeks in, in Madrid. And I was like, why not? Like, let's go there. And, and I really liked what they were doing and how they were doing it. So in 2015, I joined the firm to start the U.S. Uh, division. We, we launched in January 2016 and quickly grew to be the most profitable division uh, for them. But we also quickly grew to have differences of opinion on how the business should be run, but most importantly, the business model that they were running or that they are running and very successfully running, it's a volume model. They, they need a lot of people, a lot of managing directors, partners as they call them, and a lot of deals, and they'll close like a third of the deals. That's, that's their model, and they've been very successful at it. And, but quality and it's more quantity over quality for them. And I couldn't like wrap my head around that. So eventually in 2018, we decided to part ways and me and part of the team in, in the United States decided to start DVD partners servicing what we figure out what is a underserved side of the, of the market for M&A transactions and corporate finance, because we don't, we don't, do only m a we do all of different corporate finance and yeah in 2018 we spun off uh, pretty much the entire team that i had in one-to-one -one. they decided to shut down the u.s operation they didn't want to invest in growing the team here etc which was kind of the, the 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 main breaking point i wanted to build an infrastructure here to have u.s standards and, and u.s quality of service and they wanted to keep on doing all of the back office in spain and just you know producing here we're solely give, giving the results here, but it wasn't going to be there. So that's that's how we decided to to start DVD Partners, and you know we've been doing that for the last four years. Awesome. So talk to us more about your specific business model that's different from one to one, right? You talk about them doing volume, quantity over quality. So you know what does a typical deal flow look like for you guys, for example? Yeah. So what we did is we. We focus more on quality of deals and my, my managing partner comes from, from UBS. You know, he had the, your entire, the, the classic investment banking training and, and career and then went, went to private equity and then started a, a BC firm himself. Uh, but we brought that the same process that big banks, uh, UBS and some of our other uh, managing directors come from CD and some other, other big banks. We brought that process to the lower middle market. So the books that we create, uh, the Sims, which are the books that we use to go to market, if you see it, you won't see the difference between one created by one of the big banks in New York City and the ones that we create. Uh, our financial modeling and, and all of that is, is up to par. And, and that honestly drives the value of the businesses up, but also opens doors with, with other potential buyers that would not look at what a business broker or your usual run of a meal of the meal uh, mill market investment banker does, which is more of a chop shop, you know, just very quick turnaround stuff. Uh, and that's that's not what we do. We 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 focus on quality. Uh, we focus on on perfection and, and going out to market with with really really great projects. Uh, so we don't take every deal that comes to us. We take a lot of time figuring out which deals we actually can bank and, and are going to be successful when we go to market. And, and that gives us a very high closing rate, but also lower numbers on, on the volume side. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of our business model, quality over quantity. Cool. Go ahead, Landon. I can yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> um, yeah, that's that's great. And tell us... Um, Help us help us understand kind of like, uh, you know, you said that you're a little bit more focused on, you know, quality over quantity and that you're pretty, you know, um, uh, you're pretty, 
not exclusive, but you're really diligent in the deals that you take on to make sure that it's a right fit. And that's very similar to Austin and I's uh, business model as well. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, you say that you guys kind of focus in the lower middle market space. Uh, so I think most people probably don't know exactly what that means. So can you talk to us a little bit about like, you know, the size of the businesses that you represent and kind of what the transactions kind of look and, and feel like? Sure, absolutely. So what we define as the lower middle market are companies that are going to, are going to have an enterprise value of $250 million and below. Uh, we think once you get above 250, you're in, in the pure middle market. Uh, and, you know, if, if you're closer to a billion, you're in the higher middle market. And then everything above a billion is, you know, your run of or the main street market. Uh, but anything 250 and below, we, we consider the, the lower middle market. Most of our clients are anywhere between 20 to $150 million in, in enterprise value which if you want to break it down for another easier metric to wrap your head, head around, their EBITDA is going to be anywhere between one to $10 million. Uh, and depending on the industry, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to put you in, 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 into that 20 to $150 million enterprise value. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So is there a, a specific industry that you guys kind of focus on or really, you know, gravitate towards, or does it, are you really just looking at the company and determining if, if the company, you know, is somebody that you guys feel is a good fit to bring to market? It's, it's the latter. Uh, we, we were pretty industry agnostic. There's some stuff we don't do. Uh, we don't do real estate, for example, we don't do retail, uh, we don't do oil and gas, uh, especially oil and gas on the exploration and infrastructure side of things. Uh, it's just, and, and we wouldn't do anything life sciences. If we need a PhD to understand what our client does, we're probably not going to be the best ones representing them. So that gravitates uh, us naturally to more traditional businesses. So we do a lot in manufacturing. We do a lot of in, a lot in distribution, all sorts of business services, all sorts of uh, technology consulting, software as a service, healthcare, uh, especially on the healthcare services, healthcare, healthcare technologies, healthcare uh, consultants, stuff like that. Uh, food and beverage, uh, my managing partner in, in UBS worked at the uh, food and beverage uh, practice. So they he did like, you know, multi-billion dollar deals with uh, Navisco and, and companies like those. Uh, I have a lot of experience with business services on the marketing side of things, which was a business I ran in Mexico, financial services, uh, insurance. Once one of our, our executive directors comes from uh, a big, big insurance company in, in New York and, and ran their, their M&A, uh, semiconductors, technology and, and stuff like that. Sandy, uh, our managing directors. So we're pretty industry agnostic. We have a lot of experience in, in different industries. Uh, but yeah, we, we focus more on, on having the right company and, and the right management team to run that business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I, I thought would be kind of um, hopefully beneficial, kind of helpful for our, our, our listeners and our, you know, our people that are following along is to kind of just like set the stage from, from the get go so that we can kind of understand like the process that you walk one of your clients through. So hypothetically, Austin and I introduce you to, you know, Bob Smith, and he started a manufacturing company, you know, 30 years ago, and they've got a, you know, they're making a couple million dollars a year in profit. And Bob is thinking, you know, I think I might want to, you know, get out of the business and uh, uh, might make sense to sell to you know, one of uh, his competitors or, a, you know, a private equity firm or whoever, and they get introduced to you. So I I'm sure we could spend hours talking about <laughs> your guys' process, uh, but just at a high level, just kind of help us understand, like when someone gets introduced to you, kind of what would they expect to kind of get in, and what would it feel and look like to work with you guys? Absolutely. No, thanks. Uh and yeah, we could talk about this for, for weeks, probably. Uh, the, but but I'll, I'll break down the process in, in, in some like very uh, easy steps. The first stage 
that it's what we call the documentation stage. And it's when we document the deal. And that starts with us diving into the business. Uh, we, we like to get, you know, three to five years of historic financial numbers so we can see, you know, the insights of the business. At the end, a business is as good as the money it produces and how it produces that, that money. So our team will dive in into the numbers and start rebuilding the whole thing. Uh, a lot of companies have really good CFOs that want us to use their projections and, and, and you know, have this amazing 10 or five year story. Uh, we, we really appreciate them sharing it with us, but we're going to go back to the thoughts and do it ourselves because that's the way we actually understand the business. And it's not because I want to do more work. It's like I need to understand the business from the inside and, and the numbers talk to us. So that's part of what we do. And then we're also going to be getting a lot of information from the company. We want all of their sales product, uh, sales uh, documents, all of their uh, product catalogs, main distribution areas. Like we want to understand the other, the, the commercial side, the technical side of the business, et cetera. We gather all of that information. And, and with that, we start writing the book, right? We, we also have a very important part of it, which is when we get our analyst team that's going to be writing that with the owner uh, on the phone for that person to tell us the story of the business. Because at the end, that's, that's the best person to tell you how this business was, start, was started. And you can feel the passion when they're talking. You know, you, you see where their faces lit up. You, you see where their, their, their tone changes when they're talking about certain times and certain things they do. So we do that. And, and with all of that, we document the deal. Uh, that means we, we build the book. Usually it's a hundred page document uh, that tells the story of the business, paints the current state of the business, explains the, the market they play, the market uh, uh, playing field, and also tells the story of the future, both financially and with words. Like this is where this business can go to. Uh, we try to do it very broad with clear triggers for different kinds of buyers, but you don't want to focus on one specific buyer or one specific asset class because this is going to be read by a lot of people. The importance of, of, of the quality of this is not because I'm obsessive compulsive and I like things that are, are high quality, is this is going to be read by a lot of people. And you need to make sure that the, the, the private equity analysts sitting in New York City will have a great understanding of it as much as the German strategic buyer and the, you know, maybe a family office based out of LA. And that document is actually how you're saying, telling that story and it, it gives a lot of uh, context. So that's why we're, we're so focused on the quality of that. We'll rebuild the entire model that goes into the sim. And finally, the, the last uh, document we create is, is what we call a teaser which is basically a blind executive summary of the business that tells you what the opportunity is, gives you an idea of the industry and the space, but never tells, you, you can't retro-engineer to figure out which company we're selling. And we have certain trade secrets to make sure that that can happen. Uh, and that's a documentation stage. Uh, then, and, and if there's any questions or anything, just stop me, I'm happy to, to, to dive uh, deeper. At the same time, another side, uh, set of our team is doing what we call the mapping. And basically what we're doing is we're seeing out in the entire universe of buyers who are potential buyers for this. And a lot of clients say, hey, my direct competitor is the best buyer. Yes, we're gonna have all of your competitors, but we also wanna, don't wanna uh, forget family offices. We don't wanna forget private equities. We don't wanna forget maybe some of your suppliers or some of your clients that might be wanting to vertically integrate upstream or downstream. And for them, it's more, much more valuable than any of, of the other asset classes. So we'll map out the entire uh, ecosystem. Usually this comes up with you know, thousands of potential buyers, uh, which we not only have the name, but we also during that mapping process have the, the contact information of the key person that's got the decision maker that we need to uh, contact. A lot of them will already have connections. You know, we've been doing this collectively for over a hundred years. Uh, we have a bunch of databases and, and we buy more and more databases, et cetera. So we get all of that information and we go over it with our client. 
sometimes they say, there's no way I'm going to sell to that distributor because he screwed me over five years ago and like take him out of the list. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and, and then we go to market. Uh, and when we say we go to market, the, the, sta- the first stage is we go with the teaser, the blind executive summary. We reach out to the companies. We say, hey, we have an opportunity. Uh, we send it, you know, we explain to them over the phone or over an email. We, we already have these conversations with them ongoing, so it's easy for us to, to get in touch. We share with them the teaser. And if they're interested in learning more about the opportunity, we'll get an NDA in place. Then they'll get on the phone with whoever is running the deal. So it, it might be me, it might be our managing partner, one of our managing directors, whoever is running the deal will get on the phone, usually a 30 minute introductory call where we still don't disclose the name of our client, but we explain a little bit more about the business. We give a little bit, we have an NDA, we give a little bit more of details, we narrow down the industry, et cetera, et cetera. If after that there's still interest, we give them access to the data room, data room where they have the SIM, the book that we wrote, they'll have a copy of the uh, financial model and some other information that we might consider important for them to have. This is a secure data room. They can't download information. They, only, they can only see it. Everything is watermarked. It's protected by the NDA, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're very careful about our clients' private information. After that, we usually have a bunch of emails or conversations going back and forth, asking for more information, et cetera. And once they indicate interest and they explain, look, yeah, we are interested in buying this company, potentially buying this company. This is kind of the structure that we're thinking about. This is, then we get them on the phone with our, with the client uh, for what we call, you know, an initial conversation. It's not a full management presentation, just an initial conversation. Uh, We want to make sure this might sound weird, but that there's a chemistry between both parts. Uh, because at the end, even if it's a full buyout, there's going to be a six to nine month period where you're working together. And if you just can't see each other face to face, it's just not going to work. And, and you know, we'd rather save that time to us, to our client and to the potential buyers. Uh, if there's that chemistry, we'll ask for a, a letter of intent from different buyers. We, we like running broad auctions and basically a letter of, in term of in intent. It's a term sheet that tells, you know, this is what we see. This is how much we think it's worth. This is how we're financing it. These are the conditions to close. This is how we see the combined entity. There's a little bit of selling there of the buyer to the, to the uh, seller and a lot of information there. Uh, we receive a bunch of them. We analyze them all. We present it to our client. Uh, sometimes the company that's offering the most money in our opinion is not the best option because there's a lot of other things involved uh and it all depends also what the client wants sometimes our clients are like look we're not that much uh, we're not focused that much on cash at close we actually want to stay with a with a big chunk of the business for the second bite of the apple or i'm more worried about you know my my core management team to stay on board I've already made my money and yeah, it's nice to have another 20, 50 million bucks in my pocket, but I, I really want to make sure that my employees and my legacy stays for, for the long run. So we focus on all of those things. We prepare uh, an analysis of all of the LOIs and, and once our client with our help and the help of you know family and attorneys, et cetera, decides, okay, we want to go with option A, then we sign that LOI which usually has an exclusivity period of 60 to 90 days. 90 is the uh, usual. And then you go into a due diligence. And, and that's, you know, that's the hardest part of the, of the process for everybody involved in it. You're going to have a bunch of auditors, uh, quality of earnings, tax, uh, legal, et cetera, just poking around your business, asking a lot of questions uh, and, and, asking for a lot of information that sometimes you don't have, sometimes you have, but you don't really like to look at it. And, and you know, you, you need thick skin to, to run through the whole process. Uh, you sh- usually there, the buyer has uh, a quality of earnings firm that's doing the, the quality of earnings. And base, a, a quality of earnings is just basically an analysis of all of your earnings to see, you know, how they, they survive in the future and what's the quality of them. 
you know, you, are, can we actually count on this, all of these earnings moving forward? Is it going to be uh, part of, of the business or is it just a one-off, et cetera? Uh, so we want to make sure that the, the earnings are what we're saying that they are and not some financial engineering that, that we did to make it look prettier. Uh, there's also, you know, tax. They want to make sure there's no taxes, no other liabilities, legal audits, et cetera. So everybody's poking around the business for a good 90 days. Uh, and after that, you know, if everything works correctly, 30 days into the diligence, the attorneys start writing uh, the SPA and the, the purchase agreement, the stock purchase agreement uh, or an asset purchase agreement, depending on what kind of transaction you're doing. But they start writing the purchase agreement and no, we start negotiating terms and start negotiating business terms and eventually end up with a, with a work, workable document for both sides. Uh, and, and that document has a lot of information, everything from how the deal is closed, what happens after closing, if there's an earnout, if there's a seller's note, everything is contained there. But also there's this, this really obscure uh, part of the, of, of the purchase agreement called reps and guarantees where you're representing and guaranteeing that everything you said and showed during the, the, the sales process is true and accurate. And, and there's clauses that say what happens if it's not. Uh, and if you break one of those reps and guarantees, there's you know liabilities and, and so forth. So that's a process, it's like a very long process in a very short uh, condensed manner. And it actually, it's, it's pretty similar to when we're doing sell side or when we're doing restructuring or when we're doing capital uh, raising or when we're working on the buy side. So the process is pretty similar. Uh, sometimes that the emphasis is more in, like if you're doing a full sale, that's a process. If you're just doing a recap, uh, you don't have to tell the whole story of the business and et cetera, because you, you're most more focused on the quality of the financials and how are you gonna be able to service the debt uh, but it's pretty much the same, the same stages, just different focuses. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, so I've been doing this for 20 years. Landon's been doing it for about 12, I think, if I, if I have that number right. Uh, we've worked with M&A firms in the past. We've been involved in transactions. We know about a whole lot more transactions because of other colleagues that we have. And I've never in that 20 years had somebody that clearly, now you unpacked a lot, but that clearly explained the whole process and the way that it goes from start to finish. And so, you know, a couple of things that I, that I gleaned from that is what, one, to go back to your comment about uh, investment bankers, to use your words, uh, being, an, being assholes. Uh, I think if we all had a dollar for every investment banker that we met from Harvard that was an asshole, we'd all be <laughs> right? Because every one of them thinks they're the smartest guy in every room, right? But uh, so I, I did have to get that out there. But um, what I see from you is even though you guys are working in the lower middle market, the experience that you have with your team and the approach that you guys take, it's no wonder that you find such success in that market. You've chosen that market, but you do it with every bit of professionalism as the the, the upper market works with, works in. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and thanks for saying that, but yeah, that's, that's our objective. Uh, and I guess Landon was right. I speak m &A, So that's my Ford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I, I tell you, so there's one thing that I think may surprise our listeners and, you know, with m and I mean, you know, this as well as anybody it's cyclical, right? Yep. There's, there's lots of deals, then there's few deals and, you know, the market's good, the market's bad. It's just like any other kind of market that you can think of. Um, but I think that it may surprise our listeners to know what the market's like right now and what it's been like over the last 12 to 15 months. So talk to us a little bit about what you've seen over the last 12 to 15 months and what you're seeing now and, and into the next 12 to 18 months. It's, it's scary because it's been a bull market for the last eight years and it doesn't seem to be slowing down at all uh and you know i i'm, I'm not going to get into economics and, and try to understand what's going on with the fed and and, and uh you know the treasury and, and and all of those things but i mean if the interest rates stay low and investors are not getting returns uh in in you know more secure assets elsewhere I think M&A is going to continue to be the, one of the 
biggest uh, growth uh, strategies that private equities have. And of course, now you have SPACs and, all, and I'm, not an, I'm not an expert in SPACs and I personally don't like the SPACs. Uh, so I, I'm not going to go in there, but, but I'm, I'm also not an expert, so I can't really critique them uh, professionally. But you're seeing so much money going into the market. Like every single day, I see a new private equity that just raised another 200, 300 million. Uh, you know, and that's that's a low end private equity. Like that's a first round. Usually, their first fund is anywhere between 150 to 250 million, which means, you know, if you consider they're going to put at least two turns on EBITDA uh, of debt in, in, into anything they they're buying, if they have 200 million dollars of cash dry powder, as we assholes like to call, call it, <laughs> in, in the bank means they're going to do almost half a billion dollars worth of acquisitions, uh, which just, it's an outstanding amount of money for one firm to be doing, especially if you're buying companies that are worth, you know, anywhere between 20 to 100, uh, and then you're putting some, some other stuff. So what I'm seeing, look, multiples keep on going up. Uh, five years ago, in the lower middle market, you were talking about anywhere between six to eight times EBITDA. Now you're talking anywhere between eight to 12. There's certain industries like healthcare, education, ed tech, distribution that are 12 to 16. Uh, and and it's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's a great moment for business owners to, to be exiting. And and not to get into, into politics or anything like that either, but there is, you know, this looming tax reform coming that's going to make a capital gains, et cetera, are going to be taxed at a, at a higher rate. And we did an analysis. And if that whole plan comes into effect, you will have to get almost three X, a, a three higher multiple on your EBITDA just to get the same amount of money in your bank account if it comes in, into play, right? And I don't know if it's gonna come into play and I, I, I don't wanna get into, into the politics of it. Uh, also not being a, a US citizen, I don't really understand the politics. So, <laughs> but I understand the math behind it. Uh, and that's huge. I mean, it means growing at a 10% clip for five years to reach that, that level of uh, liquidity so we're seeing a lot of business owners saying, hey, how can I take advantage of this before the, the tax change? And, and we're getting into that window because a correctly run process takes anywhere between six to 12 months. The average is around nine months from start to close. Uh, so we're getting to that window where we're saying, you know, if you wait a little bit more, because if the closest, and I, I'm not an attorney or an accountant, but what I understand is, if you close in January or February of next year and the tax reform passes in March or April, odds are it's gonna be retroactive to January 1st, 2022. And you guys understand this way better than I do. So yeah, there's, there's a clock ticking, but that's what I'm seeing in the market. Huge multiples, an astounding amount of liquidity and both buyers and sellers eager to, to get transactions done. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. I think what's even, even more shocking is the fact that we've been in this bull market for eight to 10 years, depending on how you look at it. And there's still all of this dry powder, as you say, on the sidelines, like they, they're, they're craving these deals. And you're thinking, where in the world do they have all of this liquidity still when we've done so many transactions over the last eight to 10 years? Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. It's just, it, they keep on raising and raising and raising funds. It's mind boggling. I think Landon must keep putting the man's money to work. And that's what <laughs> I, I've yeah. heard that. I've heard that all the money comes from Landon. <laughs> uh, it really does. You know, not all of it, but you know, uh, you know, at least 25 to 50% is coming from uh, my checkbook here. You know, uh, Ilya, one of the, one of the things that I, I, I love about having conversations with guys like you is that, Although Austin and I have a lot of great, you know, really thoughtful, you know, wonderful conversations with, you know, business consultants and, and people that, you know, advise on, you know, exit planning and small business planning, et cetera. We have a lot of great conversations, but what I love about talking about 
with a guy like you is that you are down, you, you are in the trenches and you are the one that is actually making these transactions happen. And so I want to take advantage of, of your experience so that we can pass along some good, you know, nuggets to our, to our listeners. So when you, when you're dissecting an opportunity or, or a deal, maybe as you, you call it, what are, what are maybe just, you know, one or two or three things that you really look for in a company that says, okay, guys, like this, this is a legitimate business based on these one or two or three things. Like we need to pursue this opportunity and dig deeper to it because I, I think, I think there's something here with this company. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, if I had to dissect it down to three things. Or just, you know, maybe just a couple of things that kind of going to pop sure. off. Oh. I mean, the first thing I, I like on a good opportunity, uh, and let's say any business in any industry that like you can think of, if they have good information, that's for me, that's a win. Like if I'm on the first conversation and I can ask the, the business owner, what was your revenue last year? What's your, your EBITDA? What, what's your margin? What's your conversion rate? How much do you have in inventory? How much do you think your equipment is worth? It's, and they have all of that information either on the top of their head or they can quickly just dial their CFO or, or, and somebody just has the, the information. That for me, it's peace of mind because that's the main thing. I, I want to know that the information that we're not going to be pulling strings and you know hurting cats to get that, that information, but also a business owner that has that kind of uh, control over the information, it, it means that the business is, is running uh, correctly. Then I, I wanna see steady cyclical logical growth. Like I don't like to see spikes and don't get me wrong, we can sell companies with spikes either up and down, et cetera, et cetera. But those, you, you, you need to clean the noise of those and see what the actual business looks like in, in a five, 10 year period with clean growth. And I, I like to see that, uh, that it makes sense. And I like it to be a little bit above the industry trend. Uh, same thing, for example, with, with margins, right? Like if you're talking about a manufacturing business that has usually around 20 or the industry standard is around 20 ish margins and they're in the high twenties, you like that business or you're doing something right and, and the buyers are gonna are gonna like that so those those are kind of like the things i like from from the get-go uh i like to see industries that are not highly consolidated because that gives buyers an opportunity to, cons to consolidate that space i also like the owner to tell me well if i had the money i would go buy this guy down in las vegas or i would go buy this guy down in north carolina because they're great at what they do uh I actually don't like businesses or business owners that think that nobody does things better than they do and hate all of their competitors. For me, that's a red flag. Like you really don't know what, what's going on out there. Uh, those are some of the things that I like uh, dissecting. Now, you can have a business that it's a mess. They don't have data or they, they have data, but it's not correctly organized, et cetera, but it's in a really, really, really hot industry. Uh, then you, you can compensate for that. And I can be like, yes, we, we are going to take this business to market just because there's such demand. And I know who the obvious buyers are that even if I don't have the right information, uh, I can build that information, but I know that it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the pretty girl in, in the dance uh, and, and everybody's going to want to want to go out with it. So those are kind of the things that I look into either a very solid business, correctly built, correctly, uh, analyze with a lot of information or a very, very hot industry that you pretty much can for, throw anything into the pot and, and they will buy it. Now, in my experience, the first information control quality will get you a higher multiple than a hot industry. Uh, even if the hot industry is paying huge multiples, if you had a hot business correctly managed then you would be the, the, the crown jewel. So on, on the flip side of that, what is, you know, just 
you know, one or two things maybe that you look at and you're like, yeah, deal, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a deal killer or just too big of an obstacle to overcome. Yeah. Well, one is delusional business owners, uh, you know, business owners that think, oh, well, I read that the companies are trading at 20 X and unless you get me a hundred million dollars, you know, for a business that's making 3 million in EBITDA, I'm, I'm not going to sell. Like, I'm, I'm like, that's, that's not, I, I steer away from your classic startup BC deals uh, where they're going to be the next Uber or the next Facebook but they don't really have a clear path to get there. They just really like to have uh, money. And that, that brings me, I think, when I, when I sit across the table some, with somebody that just wants to sell the business because they want to be rich, that for me is, is a red flag uh, because there, there's no passion into the business. I, I like business owners that if it was up to them, you know, if, if we can't sell the business. I'll keep on running it. Uh, it's a great business. I really like what we do. Uh, I didn't build it to be sold. Uh, that those are kind of the red, red flags. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm not sure if you feel the same way that I do, but I tend to steer away from people who have full heads of hair too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust a guy like that. <laughs> oh my! All right, so. Let's kind of round this out and say, okay, so you're get you've gone through the whole process, right? You've got the letter of intent. You you got several letters of intent. You decide on who you're going to go with. You're filling out the purchase agreement. Everything goes as, as planned. Financing's in place. What kind of conversations are you having at that point with the business owners, whether they're selling it all or they're you know holding back a portion for the second bite of the apple? What other people are you bringing into the room at that time to help have conversations with them? What's the approach at that point? Yeah, that's that's actually a great point, and a lot of a lot of times we forget about it. Uh, once the letter of intent is signed, you need to start bringing some of your executive team to the table, right? Like the people that are going to be driving the the, the diligence. You need your op operations officer, your president. Uh, your accounting team, some of your like your key personnel, your key salespeople, you need to buy, you make them buy what we call buy into the deal, buy into the transaction. Uh, usually, you know, before we even have the LOI, we start talking with our clients about setting some sort of incentive in place, maybe giving them some uh, phantom stock or, or even some actual stock, but they need to stay with the business for two or two, three, two, three, five years after the transaction for them to best that. So you need to create that buy-in from your, from your uh, management team. The conversations I have with business owners during that process, I mean, every other week they back away from the deal because you know it's a business they, they built for the last 30 years and they don't know if they're ready to sell it. You know, it's, it's like selling one of your kids, like this has been part of my family. And you, you know, honestly, at that point, it's like, it's up to you. Like, do I want my success fee at the end of the day? Of course, that, that's where we make most of our money. But I don't want you to sell something if you're not 100% uh, sure about it. Uh, how do I know these guys are going to do right for what they're, they said they did? And, you know, that's why we have all of the conversations during the LOI selection. Like, do your diligence. We, we do a lot of diligence for them, whether it's a strategic or a financial buyer. You know, these are previous transactions. We always recommend the... the uh, the seller, hey, get on the phone with somebody that has sold to this uh, same firm before and see what they think. Get on the phone with some of their key personnel that's not part of the transaction. Uh, somebody that works from another, for another platform company or in another division, if it's a big uh, you know, multinational that's buying you, get a feel for the culture. See if you're, you feel comfortable with your company being part of that. Uh, so those are all of the, the different conversations. What if I leave it to my kids instead? Or how can I make sure that they don't fire my kid? You know, he's not the brightest kid, but he's a really good kid. And I would love to see him have a future in the business. So we start working all around those things. What we start negotiating, you know, if there's going to be a rollover when a rollover equity is when the buyer, sorry, the seller takes part of the purchase price as equity in the new combined entity. Right? 
So if, if they're going to roll over some equity, especially if it's a substantial piece of the, of the deal, well, what are going to be the, the checks and balances? Do they have a seat on, on the board? Is it just an observer seat? What kind of uh, voting rights do they have? Are they going to get diluted down the road? Because, you know, they can just be like, hey, we're going to do a capital increase and, and you need to come up with 20 million bucks or you're going to go down to 5% and now you don't have a vote. So we start talking about all of those things with everybody, with the, with the seller, with the buyer, with our attorney, well, our clients' attorneys, the buyer attorneys, just to make sure that everything is, is there. Uh, so those are the kinds of conversations that happen once the LOI is signed. You know, we have all of the consultants and all of the advisors doing the diligence and running through documents, et cetera, but we're still, it's more managing the relationship. Uh, and when the last day comes and, and, and the, the purchase agreement is signed, you wanna know that everybody has all the cards on the table and they have all the knowledge they need to know because that's just the start of the transaction. Now you have to integrate you have to start working together. You have to be good on your on, on what the numbers said, et cetera. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th those things that you mentioned are so important. You know, Landon and I get involved in a lot of that. Not, not all investment advisors do that, right? I mean, Landon and I are financial planners, not, invest, not just investment advisors. Um, I think we may even talk about this in our intro call with you that you know, investment advisors will come out of the woodwork when they when somebody's selling a business because they want to manage the proceeds, right? But Landon and I spend so much time doing the things that you just talked about, where we're getting them ready for that sale. You know, talking to them about the importance of having a good executive team, putting incentive plans in place so that they'll stick around after you've you know rode off into the sunset. Those things get missed so often by business owners, and they don't even realize that the value of their business goes up by them not being, you know, the business not being dependent on them, right? And so one of the things that we do, and we'll, we'll offer this to you for any of your clients, if you'd like, as a, as a free service, that we, we have our clients go through two questionnaires, if you will. One is the owner dependency index, right? So how much the business is dependent on the owner. And then the second is the business exit readiness index. And that doesn't just measure the financial readiness to exit the business, but the emotional and um, mental readiness to exit the business, which may be more important, right? I mean, that's how we figure out if they're going to have some of the, the false starts that you talked about, where they're wanting to walk away from the closing table. Wait, I think I want to just hold on to this. This is my legacy. You know, it, it's, it's making yeah. sure that they're really ready for that transaction because it's the biggest transaction of their lives. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I think we talked about this, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when, when we had that intro call, but a part that I, it's not that I forgot of the process, it's just part, it's, we don't do that part, but it's equally as important when you start thinking about a transaction, sit down with a really good financial analyst, financial planner, and figure out how much money you really need and what are you going to do with that money? Because 50 million bucks might sound like a lot of money, but if you have a bunch of debt in your company, plus, you know, you own your house and the vacation home and you promised your wife that you were going to buy her a, another vacation home and you want to put four kids through college and, and, you know, full ride, et cetera, that 50 million after taxes starts to look smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And all of a sudden you, you're not left with that much if you don't manage it correctly. Yep you need to know how to do that, which it's one thing I, you know, we don't do that. And, and when clients ask me, I always refer to, to way more capable people like you guys. Uh, but it, it's so important because at the end, you know, sometimes they're sitting there with, with their check and, and you see, they're not really, really happy. It's like you just made 40 million bucks. Like, well, after taxes and after paying the mortgage off and this and that, I'm really just left with five, six million, yeah. which sounds like a lot of money, but if you still have 40 years of active life ahead of you, it's not that much. Uh, yeah. So that's another really important part of the, of the pie. And then what are you gonna do after you sold your business? Uh, it's, it's like, yeah, that's a huge other thing. That's a, a, an issue for a whole other conversation with somebody else, because I don't know, but you, should, <laughs> guys, you guys should definitely, speak with like 
an executive coach or a person like that deals with post closing depression. <laughs> no, it, it's definitely a real thing. I mean, Landon and I, and I have mentioned this on the program before, and we mention it with clients all the time that most business owners, regardless of how big or small their exit was a year and a half later, they profoundly regret having sold their business. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the finances. It has to do with the fact that what they just built is no longer there and they didn't have something else that they were passionate about to replace it. So yeah. I'm going to let Landon have the final word, but I've, I've appreciated the conversation. Yeah, I had this grandiose plan. I was going to tie a bow on this conversation, but you guys literally just, uh, you stole my, my closing thoughts. So no, it's all, it's all good though. But uh, no, this was a, a great conversation. And, and, you know, based on, on what you guys just talked about, that very last topic here, which is the business owner not really doing like, you know, um, life after business, you know, uh, planning, you know, maybe a suggestion for, you know, maybe one of your associates would be, you know, go back and, and call all of your old, you know, all your clients that you've gone through a transaction with and say, Hey, you know, it's been a couple of years since we talked to you, but how are you feeling about your life now that you don't own your, you know, your business anymore. And it, maybe it'll provide some really good insights to you and your team because, um, you know, there, you can talk to a client all you want until you're red in the face about mentally preparing yourself for an exit. Right. And Austin, I literally, we've had this conversation probably a half a dozen times this year alone, where we're telling our clients, like, look, when you sell your business and you wake up that next day and your phone is not ringing and people are no longer depending on you, you're not the head honcho, you're not this decision maker, you know, you don't have the corner office anymore, your, your suppliers aren't calling you to play golf anymore, like you can't prepare somebody for that with words, right? Um, so I'd be really interested to, to see if, uh, you know, if, you know, you know, uh, um, let one of your associates go back and call your, you know, clients and we'll have you back on the show in you know, six or 12 months and you can, uh, you can report back to us. But I, I would be curious, and this thought is just kind of coming to me. I, I heard this one guy, I think he was in, you know, an exit planner or, or something. And he said that one of the exercises that he takes his clients through before they actually transition out of their business is he tells them, I want you to completely remove yourself from the business. No phone calls, no emails, no meetings. Like basically like you are dead to the business for like two weeks. And then at the end of that period, we're going to sit back down and I want to know how you felt, what your thoughts were, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you do in that two weeks. And it's just that I, I thought it's a pretty cool uh, exercise to try to you know take a client through before they actually sell their business. I like it. I like it. And I'll, I'll, I'll for sure have one of my associates uh, go back to all, all of our clients. I'll report back to you guys. Yeah, that would be, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, Ilya, this was a really cool conversation. And I'll just make one last closing, uh, uh, you know, note that, uh, you know, it's, it's so cool how this conversation came about. You know, one of your associates just reached out to me out of the blue, sent me an email, told me about who you were and just said, would you be open to having a, you know, conversation with him? And I responded and said, yeah, absolutely. And had a great introductory call with you. We had no plan to invite you onto the show, but, you know, here we are and had a great conversation with you. So this is what, this is what we're all about here, which is just, you know, giving, giving private business owners a platform to come on, tell their story, you know, uh, you know, get some, uh, get some notoriety, get some publicity, whatever you want to call it. And hopefully this uh, leads some, some opportunities for you. And that being said, uh, if somebody wanted to contact you guys, how do they, how do they track you guys down? Yeah. Uh, our website, DBD partners, like double black diamond partners.com uh, is the easiest way uh our emails is always our first name so ilia at dbdpartners.com uh yeah that's the easiest way linkedin 
and all of the all of those platforms. Fantastic. Well, Ilya, great conversation. Really appreciate all your thoughts and insights. And uh, we're going to hold you to it, man. We're, we're going to call you in six months so you can report back. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.